so all-encompassing that we can lean back on God, trusting God with the same trust we would give to the most loving and tender mother of all. I hope in today's sermon I will be able to help you along with your image and understanding of God so that your faith will grow and so that every day of your life will be more blessed and filled with hope. I think sometimes that people envision God as an angry father. I don't want to create any sort of weird mother-father conflict here, but the church portrays God like that once in a while. So I want to give a different portrayal. God as a tender mother. And I don't want to create a big argument should be called God, mother, or father. Don't even worry about it. We are way beyond that. We ought not be worried about what gender God is. We theology rises above. I'm only talking today about character steps. And up until the time of the prophet Micah, people had a sense of an angry God who made great demands on them. And Micah said, Come on, let's think about God again. And the person cries out, Well, what does God require of me? With what shall I come and bow down before the Lord my God? And Micah gives the answer, saying, You know, O oh man, what God asks, and you know what is required of you. To do justice, to love mercy, to walk in humble fellowship with God. And the image of God was changed on that day, and even though that was 800 years B.C., we still haven't gotten a hold what Micah means for us and seeing God's tender, loving care. It comes back again in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles when the writer talks about the community. And it was a community bound together by love, filled with people who had compassion for everyone around them and wanted to share the love and tenderness and kindness. And it's in passages like these that we come to see who God really is. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I'm going to go way off in a really weird direction now. And you're going to be shaking your head saying, what is my talking about now? I'm sure you've done that before. <laughs> I want to express to you the jealousy I have for the Roman Catholic Church. Because they get to have saints. And they just got two new saints. And I think, why can't Presbyterians have saints? But we're way above that. <laughs> we don't have saints. Well, that's hard for members of St. Andrews. <laughs> or St. James. Or St. Well, what's a different kind of a thing. But you see, when you make someone a saint, you embrace them. And when the church does that, they're saying, we are going in the direction that this guy is pointing. We approve and we endorse this person's theology, and we want to go there. So I want to tell you a little bit about what it means that the Roman Catholic Church has just made saints of Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul the Second, And somewhere in there, you're going to be saying, where is the message for Presbyterians? It's John the 23rd was the guy who called Vatican II, which meant from October of 1962 to December of 1965, and the cardinals gathered together and said, where is the church going? What does it mean to be the presence of Christ in the world? And they came up with the most wonderful answers. Because up until that point, the Roman Catholic Church was extremely closed, and they had this doctrine that said God only existed in people inside the church. But at the end of Vatican II, all of that had changed. The nature of God had changed for those people. Vatican II brought about a new openness to all the people of the world, and it lifted up the idea that all of humankind had dignity because God existed in all people. And there were two theologians. 
means behind all of that theological movement in Vatican II. The first was Karl Rahner, who lived from 1904 to 1984. And Karl Rahner said, you know, if I go out into the world, and I find a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or a Muslim, and he or she is a person who has a deep sense of humility, and a great capacity for compassion for the needs of others, and a great sense of the meaningfulness and equality of all humankind, I see that Jesus Christ lives in that person. And it's an awesome concept, because it opens up the love of God into this massive universal reality that isn't just based on whether you go to church and whether you can recite this doctrine or this creed or whether you belong to the right denomination. It's coming back to Micah. Where is God? What does God want of you but that you be a human being with a sense of justice and a heart full of compassion, a sense of humility? The other theologian was Henri de Lubac, who lived from 1896 to 1991, and he added to what Karl Rahner said when he said, I look out into the world and I see that all people, whether they are Catholic or Christian or not, all people have a desire for God. And that's because God is in all people, and that's because God is love. And through a great part of the 20th century, the Roman Catholic Church condemned Karl Rahner and Henri de Lubac and said they're wrong. But when Pope John XXIII heard what they had to say and saw the rising swell of excitement amongst the people, he said, let us call a council and let us talk about these things. Maybe they are right. And in the end, they made Henri de Lubac the theological advisor of Vatican II. And the church after that event was filled with this openness and this sense that God is love, that compassion for the poor is central, that tenderness and mercy are what you should be all about. And that's why they made a saying of John Paul, or sorry, John the 23rd, that John Paul II. You know, we think they made him a saint because he was such a nice guy. Such a nice, warm, smile. But John Paul II was a theologian. He carried on the theology of openness and compassion and inclusiveness. And he said over and over again, God is tender love. What God wants to do is open his arms and bring in the whole world and save and redeem and reconcile all people with tenderness and goodness. And just like John the 23rd had Karl Rahner and Henri de Lubac as his theologians, John Paul II had a theological favorite as well, who he would eventually make a cardinal, and that was Hans Urban Balthazar. Lived from 1905 to 1988. Balthazar said we need to heal our theology because we have had a theology of rigid oppression, a theology of legalism, and what we need is a theology based on the beauty of God's love for us and the beauty of God's care for the poor and the oppressed and the broken. But Balthazar was a prolific theologian and academic. He spent the greater part of his life putting together a compilation of the theological work of all Christian theology for 2,000 years, and he ended up with 15 volumes, each of which was the size of an encyclopedia. And the church said to him, Hans, that's great, but nobody's going to read 15 volumes. Could you trim it back a little bit? Could you make it a little easier for people to, could you cut it down a little bit? And Hans Norman Balthazar said, sure, he said, do you want the condensed version? He says, I'll cut it down for you. And Hans Urban Balthazar cut 15 encyclopedic volumes down to three words. <laughs> it's good. It was good editing. <laughs> and you know what the three words are? 
Now I know what you're thinking. My friend, I'm not going to catch this. What are you telling us about these things? We don't have cities. We don't care what they're doing. But I have a big secret for you. It's a wonderful, wonderful secret. Hans Lurie went about the Tsar and a teacher. The teacher's name was Karl Barth. Karl Barth was a Presbyterian. Pope Pius XII said Karl Barth is the greatest theologian the church has had since Thomas Aquinas. And it was Karl Barth who inspired Karl Bonner and Henri de Luzac and Hans Lurk and Dada. Don't tell your Catholic friends, please don't. It's, it, it doesn't matter where it came from. But it was Karl Barth who had this sense of the broadness and the depth and the magnificence and the beauty of God's love for us. There are two wonderful and very clear parallels between Bart uh, and the concerts of Mount Bonaventure. Uh, I told you he had reduced his 15 volumes down to three words, God is love. And of course, before he said that, Karl Barth was out lecturing around the world. Barth has written maybe 40 difficult, dense books of theology. And people would say to Karl Barth, Karl, could you, could you sum it up? Could you give us your theology in less than, than these 40 difficult academic books? And, and Professor Karl Barth said, sure, I can sum it up. And you should all want to look this up because it sounds so much like an urban legend, but you, you go and research for yourself whether Karl Barth really said this. He said, I will sum up my whole life's work in theology. And he would say to the crowd, Jesus loves me. They sign him. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones who him long. They are weak, but he is strong. You look at it. It was Karl Barth who, in the face of an oppressive domineering church, turned upon the church when it was speaking of condemnation, <coughs> damnation, and he said to the whole church, How can you be so sure? God has not saved everyone. It was those words sank into the heart of Karl Rahn, Henri de Lubac, and Hans Thurm von Balthasar. And they said, Yes, the point of God is that God is universally loving and gracious and healing and tender and gentle and kind wants to lift us all up and embrace us all as a mother. To make saints of John the 23rd, John Paul II was a bold move on the part of Francis I. And I know it's only a weird little side note, but it may or may not be interesting to know that uh, Karl Rahner and Henri de Lubac and Hans Ferg and Balthazar were all members of the Society of Jesus. They were all Jesuits. The Jesuits always say, how can we help the poor? How can we let the world see that God's arms are open? Uh, and of course, the Roman Catholic Church has further endorsed them by electing Francis, the first Jesuit Pope, saying, God is love. God is love. We are moving again, towards Mike of six, six to eight. Moving again towards that glorious community in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles with the people love and show tenderness and compassion. We're moving towards a better image of God, whereby we understand God like a mother who loves her children, every one of them, even the ones that mess up, like a mother whose tenderness and care is endless. We are moving towards a church where we understand that true faith is in caring for the poor and loving the outcast and seeking justice for the oppressed. This is the message that will change the 
us the disciples group in our Sunday school classes, and we have two of the teachers along, and I would like to introduce these disciples to you. We have uh, Dave Juan, and Owen, and Brett, and Carter, and Disciple Warren, and uh, Charlotte, and Olivia, and Audrey, and Disciple Jan. I think just by the very presence, they merit a round of applause. Are you listening? Are you 
hit Dave Mitchell on the head and say, <laughs> 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 we can continue the order.